foremost, I welcome you all on behalf of Jerangam Festival. Jerangam is a festival which has been promoting art and culture over the years, and it completes a decade in 2021. And many congratulations to all of you who curated and organized huge Jerangam every year. Due to the global pandemic, the festival will be held online from 17th to 19th December 2021. So all of you must uh, watch all the performances, events and panels. The theme of this year is the show must go on. And the reason for that is that we are celebrating the life and legacy of our founder director, Mr. Deepak Guerra, who passed away this year and has left a huge vacuum in the field of theater. He will always be remembered for the work he did. The show must go on irrespective of how the world scenario is at the moment. As at the end, it's art which keeps us going and will continue to do so. Today's panel discussion is about women in theater, challenges, processes, and transformation. I, Ramanjit Kaur, I welcome Neelam Man Singh Chaudhary, my guru and director, Maya Krishna Rao, and Keetana Kumar to this panel discussion today. And right now, I'll take a brief moment to introduce all the three panelists to all of you. Neela Mansingh Chaudhary, who is uh, known for her innovative work and uh, the theater of imagery, the visuals that she creates in her production all over the world. She is renowned for that. She has a master's degree in the history of arts as well as a diploma from the National School of Drama. In 1979, she moved to Bhopal and was attached to the Rang Mandal, a theater repertory attached to the multi-arts complex Bharat Bhavan. In 1984, she moved to Chandigarh where she set up her own theater company called The Company. And I have been fortunate to be working with her in the company for the last more than three decades. Alongside the company, she has also been teaching in the Department of Indian Theatre, Punjab University, and was also the chairperson of the department. Her well-known plays include Kitchen Katha, The Suit, Yarma, Nagamandala, The Mad Woman of Shayor, Little Yolf, Bitter Fruit, Naked Voices, The License, Gum Hai, and her latest piece, Black Box, to name a few. The group has participated in major national and international festivals in Japan, France, UK, Australia, and many other countries. Dr. Chaudhary is the recipient of several awards, including the Sangeet Natak Academy Award in 2003 and the Padma Shri in 2011. She is presently Professor Emeritus at the Punjab University. Welcome, ma'am, and we are looking forward to hearing your views about the topic. Maya Krishna Rao, whose work I admire greatly. Maya is a theater maker and teacher. For the stage, she has made performances across a wide range of forms, dance theater, cross media, comedy, and participatory theater programs for schools. She collaborates with other artists to create multimedia shows that she directs and performs herself. Some of her celebrated performances are Holto, which was a performance that took away my heart. Uh, the Job, A Deeper Pride Jam, and Heads Are Meant for Walking Into, Ravan Nama, and Loose Woman. The uniqueness of Maya's performances derives also from her training in Kathakali. Maya responds to invitations to perform at quick note, sometimes only a day, around issues of social concern. Walk was one such that drew great public response, created in response to the horrific gang rape in and eventual tragic death of Jyoti Singh in 2012. In the pandemic months, Maya has moved online and she's done some extremely innovative work. You all must take time out and 
watch the ones that are available online with the creation of podcast and short videos. At the invitation of universities at home and abroad, she also continues to teach and give workshops online. For several years, Maya taught acting in the National School of Drama, Delhi. Later, as professor at Shiv Nadar University, she designed a diploma program, TEST, Theatre for Education and Social Transformation, a first in any institute of higher education in India. Currently, she's visiting faculty at Ashoka University. Welcome, Maya, and we look forward to having a conversation with you. Kirtana, my dear friend, I've had the privilege of working with her quite a bit in this pandemic year. So in fact, the year brought us closer creatively as artists and as friends. Kirtana is an actor, director, dramaturg, theater pedagogue, and filmmaker. She currently serves as chairperson of the Star Institute of Development Studies. She is the creative director of Little Jasmine Productions and Theatre Lab. She has been the recipient of several awards, both for her directorial as well as performance work, including the MacArthur Fellowship, India Foundation for the Arts, New Performance Award, Oberhausen Award, amongst others. She has been working with theatre and the development sector through workshops, trainings and performance for the last 30 years. She maintains a special interest in issues of gender, sexuality, peace and social justice. She runs an artist residency program at Infinite Souls Farm, an artist retreat. And that's my favorite spot. I have also shared it live with all of you at an other panel discussions. Let's start with looking at what does it mean being a woman and working in theater is it challenging or are we at par uh, with our male counterparts um, have we had our equal share um, how has the journey been also the challenges we faced the processes that we've used creatively or to overcome these challenges and the transformation that we have seen personally or professionally in our creative work. My first question will be to you, Neela Ma'am. What are the challenges that you faced when you started your journey as a director? Was it difficult to work in a city like Chandigarh, which was not necessarily a cultural hub at that point of time in 1984, 85? What were the challenges of, and also I, I'm putting all the questions together so that you can reflect on them. Also, what were the challenges of working with a collective of people that came from different backgrounds? You worked with Nakals who came from the traditional, um, uh, you know, form of Nakal, uh, the female impersonators, and they were also the musicians who came from this traditional form and then you worked with urban actors and you brought them all together and created quite eclectic productions so did it pose any challenge the city the space the human material that you were working with mm, that's like a whole process um, <laughs> uh, well i think uh, first of all about being a woman and being a woman director i never really saw my work in terms of my gender, I think when we work, we are slightly androgynous. You know, there's the anima and the anima. So I never really positioned myself in terms of being a woman director. I worked because there was a desire to do something, to say something, and to craft something, to tell a story. Uh, I think uh, the, the whole sense of having a group that was partly urban, partly from the villages, really came from my experience of working in Bharat Bhavan. I think at that time, it was happening all over in different parts of the country, where one was trying to identify and to figure out a training process for urban actors. Because most drama schools at that time had a training process or a training method that was based on Stanislavski, male, old, Vaktenhoff. We had not dipped into our own possible tools. So I think this experiment was going on, Ratan Thiam in Manipur, Panikar 
in Kerala. So it was not. So I think in this, in a similar way, because I worked with Bibi Karan, who's from Karnataka, wanted to see what happens when two different groups of people from two different spaces, economic, education, um, vocabularies of work, uh, come together. What happens? There was no roadmap. It was just, just what is the combustion that takes place? The unexpected. Um, uh, encounter that takes between different groups of people that are coming together. You can use this metaphor even for any other group that comes, because there is no such thing as a singular kind of group or singular kind of energies that exist in a group. So even there, you're trying to create a space where everyone somewhere can be aligned to some possible uh, focus or some possible journey that we are taking together. But I think working with the uh, with the Nikals, you know, was a long process of trial and error. First, I wanted to understand them. I wanted to understand where they were coming from, the context within which they worked, the transformations that had taken place in terms of, um, you know, what I find very interesting is that they all worship a Muslim peer, Guga peer. They have Hindu names, but all the rituals yeah. that they do are based on Sikh. Uh, Sikh rituals, the weddings and deaths. So for me, it's the perfect example of the syncretic space that India seems to have been, and I hope it will reclaim. Um, but what fascinated me was the dimension of the female impersonator. Now, the female impersonator in the Nakal tradition is not like the or Nagatha, you know, where there's a mystic hue or even Kathakali or Uriyatam. Here they just slap on some powder, they stuff their bra with rolled up hankies or cotton. But the moment you enter the room, there's a sense of having transformed themselves. So the whole process is quite without fuss. Uh, but there is an inner code that is operating. So anyway, I want to cut it short because I don't want to take up too much time. What interested me was the construction of gender on the stage. How was gender constructed on the stage? Is it performative or is it biological? So that, in a certain way, gave me uh, gave me uh, lots of questions and lots of approaches on how to appear, uh, how to approach what it means to be a woman on the stage, what it means to be a man on the stage, and what it means to be a director. Without mm -hmm. gender, I hope, mm -hmm. at least in the creative space. Um, Yes, it was difficult in Chandigarh, and it continues to be difficult because unlike other cities, and I think it is, uh, I was talking to somebody the other day who said this is now the bane of most small cities, in a city like Lucknow, which has such a rich culture of language and cuisine and many things. Chandigarh is a place without history. You know, it came, it, it just came to rehabilitate uh, um, people that were coming across the newly created Pakistan and India. Uh, so in a certain way, the lack of history actually became my strength. I had nothing to dip into. There were no there were no reference points I had. So whatever references I created came from my own imagination, working in a theater space with actors, breathing, responding, creating, chiseling, hammering, work together. Um, I think I've taken enough time. Thank right. you. Very much. No, it sums up a lot for us. So thank you for that. With that, I'll move on to Maya. Maya, you started your journey a little late in life. And I came to know at a recent, you know, couple of years when you came to Calcutta and at that seminar when you shared uh, this fact. Uh, did that pose any difficulties for you? Um, and I will also weave a few questions for you together so that you can respond to them. Being a solo performer who conceives, directs, and performs her pieces herself, what are the challenges that you confront during this journey alone? And also, what support did you find for the cutting edge and innovative, sometimes or a lot of times, avant-garde work that you do? Uh, also, you work with different forms, dance, multimedia, street theater, theater in education. Do these forms speak to each other? Do they challenge each other? So the challenges that you face about putting all the forms together, 
your lonesome journey, the collaborations also that you do with a lot of technical people, um, you know, how has your journey been? Oh, God, that's many questions rolled into one, Ramanjit. Yes. Um, okay, let me start. Uh, you, you, you can remind me along the way. Uh, firstly, uh, I didn't enter theater late. Um, I, the trajectory has been um, um, uh, maybe a little bit all over the place. When you're a performer, which is what I am essentially, uh, right. I'm not a director like uh, Neelam, though there have been performers who have become directors in theater, but that's usually uh, uh, not so many. Um, mm. So because I started somewhere with the notion of the actor, I, I saw myself as an actor way back. And therefore, mm. in those days, you uh, waited to be become part of a cast uh, in a play. And so I worked mm. with several directors uh, pretty soon after uh, leaving college. Um, I wasn't professionally in theater, but I, I, we were doing plays. And as you know, mm -hmm. for a long time, and even today, the, the, the largest um, uh, field in theater is, is amateur theater. So mm -hmm. I was an actor, and we were doing all kinds of scripts from Shakespeare to Brecht um, uh, to everybody. And um, somewhere along the line, then I started teaching, and I taught for a while, and I realized uh, very firmly this is not the way to go. I am essentially a performer, and therefore, uh, that's where I need to dig my heels in. So mm -hmm. I resigned a pretty good job. Uh, people asked me why, and I said, I don't know. And I sat on my heels, or haunches, at a desk, thinking, I've got to find um, a way of making. I had imagined that I would have other colleagues coming in, uh, partners coming in, co-actors co coming in, but mm -hmm. Uh, uh, I knew I had to begin myself. And my first big challenge was, since I was not so, since I was not at all happy with the scripted play, which is my only experience on stage in contemporary theater, though uh, mm -hmm. as a performer, my, my, my origins are in Kathagali. So yes. that's the only form I knew, that's the only form I practiced, that's the only form I performed. Mm -hmm. And um, for the longest time, from my childhood onwards, there was a short stint of being in place. And now to me, it seemed after having resigned my job, that my big challenge is, what is my form? I knew right. I, it, seemed to be, it seemed to be hiding behind the curtains. It seemed to be mm -hmm. hidden from myself. And the more I sat at a table, the more frustrated I got. And it was by a series of accidents, really, that I suddenly stumbled upon the way I'm supposed to make theater. And um, I realized that I have to set up a video camera, I have to improvise, and I have to improvise for long periods of time. I can't just do it for 10 minutes and hope something will happen. You have to go through a high, you have to go and slump somewhere in a corner, even while the camera is, um, is recording you. And then from there, you have to rise again and be, uh, be, be uh, sort of catapulted into a new zone. And uh, much like how children play house house, you have to keep doing and keep making and keep that, that field of imagination uh, alive and throbbing. And that really was the big challenge, how to keep that impetus going from show to show, to sometimes start mm -hmm. with nothing. In early days, I started with a story and then uh, it felt like when I had a little bit of money to call in a live musician, it felt like, why story? Let me just listen to the music. And then after a little point, a filmmaker came in. And then I told myself, I don't need anything at all from the outside, because these two people are, are so challenging in what they are giving that we are creating a very thick, thick rehearsal space right here. Um, and so that's how the... Um, uh, journey went on. Uh, in mm. terms of, um, did you ask me something about uh, what was the other question, Ramanjit, about um, support? So, or was it about? Yeah, one question is that did you find support for this innovative, cutting edge, emo guard work that you, you see, do? When you're you doing your work, work when it's you're not the popular work, mass theater, you know, that you're no, doing. Uh, no, firstly, I don't believe in the word mass theater. 
I don't believe mm -hmm. in the word masses. I don't think there is anything like that. I also, right. I think all, many of us, probably all of us, don't, mm -hmm. uh, people worth their while, don't put themselves in brackets of, mm -hmm. is it avant-garde theater? Is it traditional theater? Uh, right. Yes, traditional or classical, you know when you're doing Kathakali, it's a classical form. Mm -hmm. But um, you don't, I didn't put myself in any category. You, okay. it's empty space. And in, in that empty space, Kirtana will enter differently, Neelam will enter differently, I will enter differently, a th fourth person will enter differently. You just make, you trust what you make. And in my case, because I didn't have an outside eye at a, at a particular date, uh, and often I would give myself a deadline in the early days and go and book um, a, a cheap enough theater. And so just be ready and go on stage. Mm, um, there was a lot of curiosity. There was a lot of curiosity. My own students, I was teaching, I went back to as visiting faculty in the National School of Drama, and sometimes students would say, Madam, kuch um, didn't understand what you're doing, but um, was, was uh, swept into the experience. Hmm. And um, I, I would say to them that well, that's exactly my standpoint as well. I myself and being wanting myself to be swept into an experience as a performer is how I make performances. And my only option is to bring and share that slightly uh, finished, rehearsed experience mm. before you and hope that you will enter this experience. I don't mm. think I'm bringing something to you that you need to. No theater person brings shows for them to be understood unless it's, mm. unless it's a very cerebral and there is a very cerebral kind of uh, theater as well. But um, right. that's not where I come from. But mm -hmm. gradually, with naturally with the internet and everybody uh, accessing the world through this, through this screen, um, yeah. our boundaries got, all got crisscrossed. And um, I, I've never faced uh, this thing about uh, what is this? What are you up to? No, right. You see, we also belong to a country where there are so many different abstract forms hmm. in in the performing arts. We yes. uh, we collapse time. We have the single gesture that can mean so many things. We know what abstraction is, and so uh, to to get, I think the problem is that we are not doing enough uh, pre-pandemic. Hmm. Now, of course, we're nicely stuck. But mm. uh, we need to be just doing more and more. And there's no right. dearth of audiences for every kind of theatre. Right. Well, that's very heartening to know. Well, and thank you for sharing that. With that, uh, Kirtana, I would like to ask you if you could share your journey as a director and facilitator who works with young people. What are the challenges you, uh, I mean, also, uh, I'm, you know, kind of combining questions for you that one is the human material of these young people that you work with. But you've also been able to create this beautiful infinite soul theater farm where you have three theater spaces, you have so many animals, you, your husband and daughter work themselves at the farm, especially during the pandemic uh, time. Uh, what are the challenges that you faced when you initially thought of the idea um of creating this kind of uh, farm and uh, did you find financial support also what is the what are the challenges that you face while working with youngsters are there challenges that youth bring in or their parents when you're dealing with them uh, you've also uh, shared with us that you would like to reflect on the uh, sustainability of theater and non-anthropocentric uh, viewpoint which you feel very concerned about and your work kind of reflects that so over to you gosh okay so just quickly to clarify actually when i started off where to start all right so i didn't start off as a director i started off in rock and roll so i started off as a singer slash actor so, so performer. So I was performing all the time. And along the way, I sort of segued into becoming a director because I wanted to make my own work because I was bored with the I, I wanted something that that I felt I was expressing and I didn't want to 
be a conduit for somebody else's story. So I wanted to be telling my own stories. And in that journey, along the way in that, I started teaching young people because that was also a way of uh, earning a living. It was hard mm -hmm. to just be an actor who, you know, is going to sit there and, and someone's going to cast. Mm -hmm. so I really started doing it only twice a week. So the truth is, even mm -hmm. now, I actually work with, with, with young people for a portion of the time. But somehow it has become magnified and I find that it's become my whole world now. But to, to, to speak further about how, uh, how I got to this, um, just ask me a question again. I've kind of lost my. So the trailer. question is, uh, you know, you thought of creating a lovely uh, theater form. Oh, okay. right. All when right. you thought so, about yeah. it, and okay. from from idea to giving it a shape, what were the challenges you faced okay. financially, practically, physically? Right. So then early on, you asked us, Raman, like as women, was it any different? And for me, the, I, this is what I have to say. I think there's something about being a woman in this field of performance where willy nilly you do work. You just keep trying mm -hmm. things. You keep trying ways. You, you find ways to express yourself. And it was in the course of doing this. Now, the farm was actually just a, uh, I would say the same way as documentary film is my right arm and theater is my left arm. In the same way, the farm is also part of that journey. I don't see it as being separate. It really came right. out of uh, having questions about, about climate change, about the world, about young people, about why we make theater. I was really mm -hmm. becoming quite obsessed with this idea of what was the need, like what, why are we really making theater? What are we trying to share or what are we telling? So working on the farm and, and, and trying to find this way of creating um, what, what I now call sustainable theater pedagogies or, or mm -hmm. pedagogies which allow young people to think about what they want to do with theater. So it may not be the old way. It may not be script-based theater. It may as well. But what is the lens? With What sort of lens are they viewing going ahead in the future? The farm became a really good laboratory for that work because mm. it, it was no, more, no longer um, an intellectual idea. When you're actually shoveling the shit or milking the buffalo or, yes. you know, up the rabbit it's not it's not a, it's not in your head it's physical when you so when you go to when i hit the rehearsal space it's with this physical energy in me that i hit the rehearsal space and it yeah. also it started posing a lot of really interesting questions which is why do we think that theater after a pandemic will retain its old anthropocentric model hmm. what else should we be listening to perhaps the falling of leaves Perhaps the mm -hmm. way the rain settles, perhaps the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the contours of the land, perhaps the way a rock sits. And in what ways can we engage with these things? You know? In what ways can we learn from just watching the way trees age, for example? So all these became very exciting ideas, and I just followed them. And with young people, what is always uh, wonderful is that they are so unafraid. They're willing to just dive in mm -hmm. and experiment and try. And they don't have the doubts or, or perhaps the, the vulnerabilities of, of people, especially theatre people who've been in the field for longer and, and who, mm -hmm. who sort of are a little fragile. So young people yes. are quite, they're cussed in their braveness almost, you know, they're just willing to just dive in. So mm -hmm. it became a really good, um, good way to experiment and to learn. But 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 also it's it's also a question of following one's journey, right? What, what is mm -hmm. one's artistic investigation, and what are your aesthetics? For me, my aesthetics have really come from my uh, early from the early days in rock and roll, and in the mm -hmm. love of that sort of rebellion and that challenging of form, and also because I was an English speaking actor, so this put me on the right. far edge of the extreme. Mm -hmm. See, I wasn't I wasn't uh, I wasn't native. I was a person who came from a very mixed community. I didn't have my mm. parents don't speak the lang same language because they didn't have a, an arranged marriage, not my grandparents either. So the common language was English. Now, how to make this feel indigenous? I rejected the right. idea that it was not Indian enough. So then in what way do I make this indigenous and feel robust for me? So these were the questions I asked and these were the questions I took to young people and they mm. seemed to welcome the the the, the feeling that they could also be, of, um, you know, looking at things from the outside in mm -hmm. and, and be peripheral to these systems and therefore be able to question systems. So.
Right. I hope I haven't taken up too much time. Yes, not at all, not at all. With that, I would like to ask all of you, and anyone can go uh, first, that all of you have spent more than two or three decades um, being a theater practitioner. Mm -hmm. uh, as life progresses, we experience a lot of things personally, um, I mean, physically, emotionally, practically. Um, and also we experience a lot of things creatively, professionally. So all these experiences together shape our thoughts, shape our creative processes, uh, shape the language in which we are expressing uh, creatively. Um, and as I said, that anyone can take that question first, that how have you seen the changes happen in your artistic expression during uh, these years of your work spanning many, many decades? Maya, would you like to take that first? Uh, I think you're muted. Uh, can everyone hear? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes. Uh, so were you were you asking Ramanjit about what kinds of life experiences have impacted on changes in the way one, uh, in one's artistic practice? Is that yes. the question or is it about the pandemic? The change? It's, the no, changes? not yet about the pandemic, no. but more about this whole spanning of, you know, the life's journey. And what are the changes you've seen in your creative expression? Well, um, I, I don't know. I can't really link it with life. For me, theater is mm -hmm. is life itself. So I, for me, uh, they are parallel streams where life has impacted or my life has impacted on theater. I can't tell uh, because mm -hmm. the because theater practice itself is not to do. I don't practice a kind of theater that is to do with representing characters, creating characters where I can draw from myself, draw from immediate experience. I mean, I do know that once I delivered my child, something happened to me, something major happened to me. But that was a whole 33 years ago. And I, and I realized that I needed to become far more disciplined. I was, I was a drifter. I've always been a drifter. Uh, and, but once she was born, time became, uh, time was not my own. I had to wait for when she would sleep and in those hours, get into a room with a great sense of urgency and say, now, come on, Maya, make. But make what? Um, I, my sense of silence came when she was asleep, when I didn't have to uh, be uh, around her. And I remember once she was born, the first two or three pieces that I made came pretty swiftly because of this urgency of time. And uh, I think not unsurprisingly, uh, many of the themes were kind of to do with uh, Koldo was to do with uh, father and daughter. Um, mm -hmm. The job was to do with uh, a mother who's living her life as a as a man and her children. So yes. uh, because my life had changed, it somehow did creep into it certainly created a sense of discipline uh, for mm -hmm. me. Another big life changing thing for me, which actually came via theater, was when I went off to England and I and I worked with a theater and education company. Yes. And uh, this is in the early 80s, when they also were going through a huge change, where, they were, where they, these theater companies that were servicing only schools were telling themselves, we are not going to take finished plays into the school. We want to take some kind of trigger, maybe a two minute trigger into the classroom and how can various kinds of theater experiences get generated from that tiny trigger? And so they were, right. looking at, they were looking at all the other social sciences, at devices. And that was really, uh, for me, uh, it, my head went 180 degrees uh, all around and another 90 degrees maybe. And um, for the first time in my life, I was actually doing, uh, if I may say, very supernaturalism because you're sitting in a classroom with high school kids and these were really rough kids from uh, very down and out regions of England and they will ask for a character 
and you will you will get their assistance in tell me about my age tell me tell me uh, what she likes tell me uh, where do you want to meet her in the park at six o'clock um, mm -hmm. and she's a character who's emerged from this two minute trigger that we've made in the uh, given them in the beginning but mm -hmm. then they, when they ask for a character and you sit there and they ask you questions and you look up at them you have to be the most believable woman sometimes man i would have to play a man or a boy and so all together this experience when i came back from england i told myself i'm not doing any teaching i'm not doing any more acting in plays this is what i'm going to do but of course life doesn't turn out like that but very uh, wonderfully for me national school of drama when i joined started a theater and education wing and right. then I did three or four participatory programs around Indian history, um, around the Inuits, uh, around what it is to live in extreme cold with only ice around you and maybe a drifting polar bear or a whale. And so mm -hmm. for seven year old. So this, uh, and I have to say that having gotten to this, uh, my worldview has changed. I don't anymore have to be the one standing on stage doing the whole performance, um, mm. which is why then I thought to set up, try and set up a, a, a study program when I joined a university, uh, a diploma program in how mm. to uh, not use, how can theater become a methodology yes. for, for learning in its broadest sense. And that yeah. really has been uh, the most uh, one of the most exciting uh, parts of my journey. Yeah. Right. Thanks, Maya. Uh, ma'am, over to you, Neela, ma'am. Uh, what would you like to share with us about, you know, I have myself been a part of this work and how our work, you know, the language has changed. So what would you like to share with our audience about this whole transformation and changes that have come in your work. Uh, you muted, ma'am. How do I get it? Uh, you, you are okay. We can hear you now. You can hear me now? Yes. Um, yes. I never seem to step back and analyze why I made this choice, why I did a particular kind of work, what were the impulses behind my choice, um, uh, but just to go, just to draw out a little journey, uh, a, a mapping of a journey, I think initially, like all of us, I started with what you call the well-made play. But even when I worked with the well-made play, I realized in retrospect that I had a habit of tossing it around, reassembling it, reconstituting it, putting the middle somewhere at the end and putting the end somewhere in the beginning. So I was already playing around with text. At some stage, I started not working with the text. I just started working with nothing, not even an idea. I walked into a rehearsal space, and I had no embarrassment in telling a group of young people who were looking at me expectantly, hoping that uh, scripts will be dished out, saying, I have no idea what we're going to do. But let's right. try and do something together. So, you know. Uh, I made plays uh, uh, by taking short stories, but nothing that was, at, you know, as, as Judith Butler says, I don't know if I can quote her verbatim, we were talking about stuff that may not have happened in my life. I've never right. faced dislocation in terms, mm -hmm. I may feel dislocated in my own space. That could be a spiritual dislocation or a um, emotional dislocation, but not mm -hmm. Physically, I've never felt dislocated or disenfranchised or uh, homeless or um, I've never felt that. But mm. this empathy, this understanding, this insight. So Sadat Hassan Monto that I worked with for many of yeah. my productions, the last four productions that I did, seemed to come from there because he was actually talking about the human condition, which is all around us and which is very difficult not to be impacted or not to be um, uh, distressed by what is happening around us. Yeah. But the last two plays I've done have very much been connected with my state of being, you know, 
you know, I lost my husband two years ago. And I think uh, Gumhe really came from the seven stages of grieving. It was about loss. It was about grief, how you deal with grief. So perhaps that is the first play that seemed to reflect an emotional space that I was going, emotional state that I was going through and which I didn't know how to handle. And because the only thing familiar, the only thing that defines, I, by which I define myself is a rehearsal space. You know, many people wanted to take me to counselors and give me pills because I was not in a good shape. But that was not the space I wanted to be in. So the rehearsal space became a space where I could somewhere through the process of, I won't say cathartic or use any of those kind of words or therapy, but somewhere I started understanding what is grief, what does loss mean? What does it mean to lose someone who is dear to you? How do you process it? Let it let it be there. Don't feel embarrassed by it. Don't seal it. Don't cauterize it. And then I think the last play I did during the pandemic, which was Black Box, had a lot to do with the horrific images that we all experienced. So somewhere, maybe in retrospect, all the work I did was somewhere reflecting something of what I call the archival memory that one stores within oneself, which spills into your workspace in some way or the other, what it means to be a woman, what it means to be in a patriarchal setup. So all those questions were being, I think all of us were asking those questions. But yes, right. I agree with uh, Maya, you know, when she said, when you do a play, the audience comes in much later. You know, it's like Henry Miller says, when you create, you were the robe of a priest. It's, it's private, it's silent, it's personalized, it's special. And whether you are doing, uh, it's no slotting. There's no way you slot the work you're doing. Mm -hmm. You're just expressing and working, and you know, it's a, uh, these days, whatever work we do is collaborative. It's mm -hmm. with a group of people. So there are many energies that uh, segue with one's energy, and you know, how you make some kind of a narrative and some kind of um, performance out of that is where the challenges are. And we don't even see it as a challenge. We just see it as a group of people who have come together to explore the unfamiliar, to meet the stranger in the room, to create some kind of voice, some kind of meaning. And yes, it's all about understanding. It's not about the familiar. It's really about dealing with uh, something unexpected. What you call the unexpected moment is what we try to explore. Thank you for sharing that, uh, ma'am. And of course, we'll be sharing uh, a glimpse from Black Box. I can hear someone from the team. If you could kindly mute yourself, Alia. Thank you. Um, we'll be showing a glimpse from Black Box uh, after uh, Kirtana shares with us that how from a performer she wanted to be a director and if you found any changes in your creative expression as a performer and a director over these uh, past two decades. In fact, I've, it's been something I've been... You okay now, yeah. Okay. It's a wonderful question. It's it's something I've been thinking about a lot this this mm -hmm. last these last two years. So when I started off, my the first production that was my own production, so not something I was performing in or directing for someone else, was 1993. Coincidentally, the year my daughter was born, uh, and it was it, it was really everything from then on happened with a very clear credo that the personal mm -hmm. was political so we were going to work and this was going to be the the sort of the engine that drove everything so we started with my children which was the same year that Samvada local NGO did the first all India survey on childhood sexual abuse and they gave this data mm -hmm. to us and we created this play and subsequently I mean I'm, I'm not going to talk through all the work but the work just kept happening but what I observed mm -hmm. that initially I mean if I have to look back on it now initially I was quite reticent about the fact that my process was different. I was quite, I thought this is me and this is how I work. And, but when I look at it now, I understand that in fact, what I was in pursuit of was something that was quite 
was quite uh, feminine in its in its layout, which was I wasn't looking to be an uh, authoritarian director. I was looking for some sort of collaborative spirit and something that could emerge from the group and a sort of diffuse abstraction, if you would like to call it, that would be the the creative plasticine that we would work with. And so initially I had this great temerity and I thought, oh, the reason the reason work goes or prizes go or awards go to other people is because, you know, whatever these questions about quality or whatever. But now when I look at it uh, back, when I look back on it, right, there's, I, I see it differently. I see that these processes are actually threatening because if you do processes which are not in the old model, these are threatening processes. Because if you say like, I'm going to, um, I'm going to work with multiple authorship, or I'm going to work collaboratively, or I'm going to uh, work on material that is not uh, immediately recognizable as stage worthy or whatever it is these are it, it's not it's disturbing to the status quo so now i i see it in that way and what really enthuses me actually it's been so wonderful listening to both maya and neelam this gives me so much like hope for the work going forward what i see more and more is that women have really worked in very unique ways and we've yes. not named it that we've the not clearly marked over there yeah so i mean whatever you call it i'm not so into gender as a thing i'm really uh, interested in this feminine quality in men as much as in women or trans or anything but i'm really curious mm. about the ways in which this quality has changed the the landscape when i first started mm. performing i was very much in a director centric uh, world you know where like some director mm. got a script and you got cast and you you performed and even then we were doing st street theater so even when we were doing political theater in the early 80s it was still within that landscape. But I've noticed along the years, I've really seen the way that women have changed things around. So I, I see it with younger women here in Bangalore, for example, there's so many names that come to mind who are doing documentary theater, device theater, like really yes. putting the personal out there, you know, really, really expressing it. And for better or for worse, not always getting the venue or getting the festival or getting the anything, but they're still going for it. And, I, and mm. I find that really amazing. I feel if not for the Mayas and the Neelams on whose shoulders we stand, it, we would still be living in that single author directorial uh, landscape, you know? Yes, their so generation I, I, did it. I, I feel that this is something that is not often acknowledged. So I would like to, mm. in, a, on a, in a public platform, I would like to acknowledge it, that there is in that. fact a difference, that there is, I have noticed in my experience as an actor working with women directors, or as a or as a you know as a writer who writes about other people's form and other people's theater i've noticed the difference and i think it's fantastic i've noticed the way that uh, there is a, there's a, it, a lot of men also work like that not saying it's a, that's why i call it a feminine quality it's mm -hmm. a quality that listens that negotiates Absolutely. that uh, is is kind of sensitive to um, change or or has its ear to the ground a little more mm -hmm. and is unafraid to try uh, stuff that is, uh, you know, like what Camille Palia calls the tonic, the C H T H O N I C, but that of the earth, of the of menstrual blood, of roots, of trees, of berries, of you know, of cow dung, or, but uh, stuff like that. And I, to me, that's the that's been really the greatest change in the last thirty five years. That there are yes. many more who are engaging with this. Thank you for bringing that forward and sharing it and pointing that out, Kezana. Extremely significant. Uh, with that, it's very important that we share small clips of the works of all the three artists that we have with us. I would request Abanti to first uh, share uh, Neelam Ji's work, uh, Black Box, that is a recent work during the pandemic. And we have short clips for each one of you. And you could then later um, reflect on that. Black Box by Neelam Mansi.
with that, uh, ma'am, we come to the question. Um, you know, the pandemic, as you were pointing out, um, also because you've gone through uh, a very uh, intense personal experience recently, and then the whole pandemic happened uh, where you were involved with your actors and you were doing a lot of, um, uh, you know, whatever you could do from your end uh, in terms of helping out. Um, but creatively, uh, do you think uh, this whole um, experience of being alone or so much engagement with the, the media is going to affect your work? Are you looking at uh, uh, hybrid performances? Are you looking at bringing in a lot of media or technology in your work or even little bit? Do you think it is further going to affect your um, productions? Uh, you muted. What should I do? You're okay yeah. now. Okay. It's very difficult for one to know what, what one's future work will reflect. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think of Albert Camus, and I think he wrote The Plague, where he says that even many years after The Plague, it never left, that fear never left people when they opened a trunk or opened a cupboard, it pursued them. But on the other hand, Shakespeare lived his entire life during the Great Plague. Mm -hmm. And almost 65% of the population in Stratford and Avon was wiped out because of it being a center of where the plague was. Yet you don't see it reflected in Shakespeare's work, except mm -hmm. perhaps in King Lear, where he says the plague be on you or something like that. Um, so one really doesn't know, but I think it has been a, an experience which has been, uh, which has been, which has changed something within one. I think I can feel a temperamental change within myself. Mm -hmm. Things that were significant don't seem so important anymore. So I don't know. I can't see. Um, uh, I, uh, I mean, I'm not surprised that I made a work which had so much to do directly with what it means to be incarcerated. And that person is the actor. What does he do? Who does he talk to? Who does he perform for? Hmm. He performs for a bird or a, or a dog that sort of uh, peers through the window. So just that at that point, the experience was so overwhelming that nothing else made sense mm -hmm. to do any other piece of work didn't seem uh, didn't seem uh, it didn't seem like it was coming from anywhere mm -hmm. so it was so that was very strange because i remember asking many people that how come partition which is one of the most uh, dramatic things that happened to the country especially mm -hmm. to the punjabi but uh, uh, nobody really made any films on it or it happened much later, but at that mm. point, there was no evidence in the creative space. And then somewhere I read that how when something happens, it's so close to the bone that you don't have the distance to be able to interrogate, investigate, um, analyze, and make a piece of work. But I think the pandemic had a different kind of uh, impact on everybody's life, uh, which uh, certainly is a shadow that, that that's going to pursue us. I still find it very difficult to hug somebody or to touch somebody. Mm -hmm. I must come back home and wash my hands. Uh, so I mean, there are certain habit changes that have taken place uh, within a domestic space. Um, mm -hmm. So how much they will linger on, how much they will enter into one's workspace is, is for one yeah. to work and then how it enters because nothing is planned, nothing is mapped. I wonder what wonder will happen when the actors come together and the bodies kind of interact with each other physically. Well, you and know, I was at the NSD for about a month, and hmm. the work uh, that they did there was reflecting all the all that was happening around us. Whether it was Hatra, whether it was uh, the daily wage earners going home, whether it was about uh, MSP. 
So there is a kind of alertness to uh, what is happening around us. It is in the young people. It's very strong, it's very passionate. Yeah. And it's very much part of the imagination now. Maya, your work has always used a lot of media and technology, uh, at least in the recent years, the works that I have seen. So it is now during the pandemic, other theater practitioners who were not using so much of technology, but they had to come online, you know, do some mm, these kind of uh, online uh, interventions. Uh, how do you see do you think this whole experience and uh, again your work that went online was different from uh, as we have seen you during a live performance but how do you what do you feel is going to happen to your work is it going to be are you thinking of hybrid performances are you thinking of uh, some new technologies that you may have come across and using them in your work or the kind of uh, effects that neelamji talked about whatever uh, you know, you would like to share. Are you muted, Maya? Um, God, I even forget years. 2020 March, yeah? March 24th is when it struck. I keep thinking it was 2019. But Could uh, I request the team yeah. to spotlight Maya, please? We have spotlight on Ketana right now. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so 2020, March 24, I think it was, when we were given four hours of notice. Mm. And a lockdown slammed our way uh, with a no expiry date. And I think um, uh, for me, the slamming was, like for everybody else, was initially a numbing, a numbing process. And then I think for me, it became, how, how, how is theater going to, I knew that there's only one thing that's going to help me survive, mm -hmm. uh, and that's theater. Uh, some mm -hmm. kind of, uh, the practice of theater, how can I make it, uh, it'll have to be for myself because it's not going to be on stage, it's not mm -hmm. going to be paid for, and yet it'll have to become part of my routine. And mm -hmm. without much thinking, I just picked up uh, my um, uh, mobile phone, and I told myself every other day, Maya, you're going to wake up in the morning. You're going to go while everybody's sleeping at 6 a.m. Uh, you're mm -hmm. going to go into a room and record something. And you're going to post it on WhatsApp to uh, however mm -hmm. many people and to Facebook. And Inst I got onto Instagram. Uh, and uh, that's what I did. Uh, but it was only for my own sanity, my own survival, number one. Number two just before the pandemic struck and i think people like neelam and me are really somewhere privileged because uh, well if nothing else to do with age that at least we've had the opportunity to see uh, fairly um without interruption a theater career we were able to practice mm. it with um, uh, certainly uh, i would say with freedom i think i'm speaking even for neelam mm. um, uh, even if there were censorships and whatnot, it didn't ever bother us. One still made one what one had to make with mm. metaphor, with camouflage, with whatever. And then, of course, when the pandemic comes, I was in a position where I was dog tired. I was really at a point of a burnout, yeah. really. So for me, it was in one way a welcome thing, but in another way, very frightening because I had to keep myself going. So I made some 22 episodes uh, yes. uh, 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 recorded on a, and I really want to do humor. For me, there is nothing more uh, challenging than humor. So uh, this woman, Paru, was, was trying to, as even I was trying to make sense of uh, mm -hmm. the pandemic, it was through the eyes of Paru and her two minute um, uh, sort of, uh, views of the world or her view of the world and of course it was a, a little uh, you know underbelly she's looking at it from under there and my my uh, the other thing that struck me as i was making these podcasts was the sheer contradictions of our society the mm -hmm. more you slammed the gates of lockdown the more people were on the move the mm -hmm. more i mean there was the whole migrant labor March right. to home, which there was no power on earth that could stop. Mm. The fields of India got uprooted from their own uh, 
from the earth and they, they got into trucks and they moved to the gates of Delhi. And I realized that, which I've, I think I've done all my life, my own life mm -hmm. is very boring, but my sustenance, my nourishment comes from the world out there and the predicaments that people have to live through. And so I would keep visiting the, and luckily I live in Delhi, so I could go to Singhu border and I could go to Tikri. I will never ever forget that I played for a sea. Somebody said later there were 70,000 women sitting there. Now for mm -hmm. me, that's a, that's a life-changing experience. I don't know how to take a step back anymore. None of this would have happened without the pandemic. So mm -hmm. they, they, for me, there have been moments of exhilaration that have come from these sheer social and uh, political contradictions. They are severe. Mm -hmm. They are devastating for us artists, more so for the people who suffer them. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, we as artists need to, I think, keep salvaging. What else is there? Like when I very often one has to now um, you know, I teach like this, and then everything around you becomes like a uh, like a stage space that you never know what you may pick up and what you may start improvising with, just to be able to enthuse a bunch of students. And I do a lot of teaching, but it's about enthusing them. And I find the Zoom format, uh, while a lot of people think it's very remote, there's some ways in which I've taken to this uh, form. I've, there's a certain intimacy yes. about. I can tell yes. students, okay, can I can I only see your chest? Yeah. And, and can I see how, how does this whole area come to life? What will you bring there to make it come to life? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I think for me, the pandemic has been just um, constant contradictions. And for a mm -hmm. performer, somebody in theater, we, we savor, that's our food. Tension and contradiction is what we uh, feed off. 
And yeah. I'm now in the business of trying to look for collaborators because mm -hmm. working with a camera is not the same as working with the camera or either the camera or this laptop or True. what is possible, what's called the digital arts. And mm -hmm. it really fascinates me. But for me, it's tip of the iceberg. I haven't gotten to it yet, but I hope to. Mm -hmm. Mm. See, uh, we were very fortunate once Bhardwaj, my co-actor who also works with Neelamji and I and Taranjit, we performed live for Bhai Baldeep Singh Ji's Yaranad virtual batted series and he uses the e-cam Maya where, you know, while being on Skype, you can zoom into the camera and zoom into the actors. So there are a lot of different kind of and it almost looks like the live performance being caught by a live camera. You know, but that's only the, if I may say, Ramanji, that's only the tip of the iceberg. Of there is a way in which digital arts can be used that jogs our own theater imagination. Yeah. It's a whole, it's not about zooming in and zooming out. It's like, yeah. for instance, if I'm sitting here, I'm just saying one tiny example. Mm -hmm. And the boxes that Neelam and Kirtana and you are in, how do I raise my hand? And by the time my hand reaches uh, Neelam's box, you see now it's gone out, but it yeah. could be that by the time my hand reaches Neelam's box, yeah. it's in a sea with maybe a whale catching my my index finger. Yeah, the you know, kind of uh, because yeah. that's that that's to do with what digital. It's arts been an interesting are. space. Uh, to explore. Uh, not just interesting. I think it will do us theatre people a lot of good. Because when we come, we are not going to come out of this pandemic, but whenever there's a little window available, this mm -hmm. fresh imagination that we've gained from having mm -hmm. played with some of the possibilities, mm -hmm. when we then go and stand on stage, it will be with another body, another mind, another imagination, and we will be very different artists. Completely. I agree, yes. Uh, Kirtana. Uh, you've brought two wonderful productions done by youngsters to Dramebazi International Theatre Festival, and they were intimate, they were interactive, uh, as Maya has very rightly pointed out, you know, this very, um, uh, a space that opens up so many possibilities, and you did uh, try to explore so many of them during these two productions that I have myself seen, been a part of, um, what would you like to share? How are you looking at your work? How much of intervention of technology are you looking at in your work? Uh, you muted, you muted, you muted. I have really loved, I mean, okay, so for me, doing in the hour of God, for example, was a sadhana during the, mm -hmm. during the pandemic, because I just declared to myself that I needed to hold my community. So I, announced 50 actors reading from Sri Aurobindo Savitri because this was a text that nobody ever reads and it's a text mm -hmm. about life and death about the big questions really heavy shit so I said okay come on let's tackle this but I will I will create it through video art interventions I will create it using visuals of the pandemic and people mm -hmm. will send me what what they're looking at in, in their home or outside their windows and I'll do it so this became sort of just a daily, uh, you know, just every day you sit down on FCP and every day I, I was, I undertook this really intimate task of listening to people's voices. This was a beautiful, and when people tell me, you know, this isn't, there's an embodied space uh, stage and this is, it's all for me semantics. This for me is my stage now, you know, I don't have another stage, this is my stage. So what became really beautiful was listening to just voicey, voices. So it's disembodied, right? I'm not looking at the body of the person. They're not on stage. They're fragile. They're at home. And they're reading a text that perhaps they don't even completely understand. Some of them do. But they're struggling through the text. It was very, very intimate to just listen to voices of, of actors all over the country. So this was something. Um, I made 36 of them. Please watch them. Yes. And I hope I yes, reach 50 I at because. some point. But, you know, it was really a tender exercise. And then became mm -hmm. this other, my Instagram play, which was Nagama's Letters, became, happened because I was just communicating with Nagama, who was on the farm, and I was sitting... And we'll be the, sharing uh, a clipping from Nagama. Yeah. But it, it was just because the only way to communicate with her was on WhatsApp through images. 
because she's non-literate and I'm literate. She knows more about the farm than me. I'm trying to communicate snow. So again, this became kind of a, what is the, if you had a Venn diagram of these two worlds, what is the intersection? What is the, what is the plasma in that intersection between her and me that, that is delicious for, that, that we enjoy without any politically correct notions or any notions of anything else, but just why do we communicate in the way that we do? Why do we have fun together? And I, I, this happened through Instagram stories. So now I have to take those Instagram stories and stitch together with music and with text. I have to stitch together this, this play. And what form this play will take, God only knows, right? Because I don't know what the future holds for me as a performer, but I will keep performing. So I will pick up like a magpie what is available to me and I will try and find a form. So... Um, yeah, I, I, I have really found the pandemic creatively very exciting. Right at the start, we did, we did a symposium on how, what are the technologies? What can we do now that we still have to keep working with young people? We can't shut down theater because the venues are closed. I mean, the venues are not all powerful, right? The venues are just a geographical space. Artists are all powerful. What we want to say is all powerful. So how do we empower that and not become victims who are just like, Oh, you know, I can't do anything. How do we not? How do we avoid that? How do we keep up our rigor? So those were the, and and again, this sustainability thing, you know, to bang on about it. I'm completely excited and interested because I've met actors mm -hmm. who are working with a plant, or actors who are trying to do a choreography with an with. Recently, I saw beautiful choreography with a dog. So mm -hmm. just these ways in which people are trying to figure out things at home, you know and trying to communicate these. So I found it, and also, oh, I have to say this, I was getting really quite tired of the way that proscenium theater was happening. I felt it had mm. reached a sort of status mm. quo. You know, there were gatekeepers, there were certain sorts of productions that were making it and those were not, and there was all this uh, hangama about it. I really was not interested. I really was, uh, this gave me the opportunity to suddenly expand my audience. I found this a very intimate stage and a way to enter people's homes and like, wow, this is a, a gift and an opportunity. Uh, as always, um, strife is an opportunity as well, isn't it? It's so, like we were connected in our separation. Yeah, yeah. And we struggle to find ways to meet each other. I like even that simple exercise, you know, like with the kids, we're constantly trying it through a Zoom window to, to show the audience that we're actually in the same house. So how many different ways can we yes, show an audience that in the same house? You know, do we do we meet each other across our windows? Do we have the same wallpaper? Do we speak the same language? What are the ways in which we can do that? So it's exciting. Well, thanks to all of you and uh, Team Jerangam will be sharing uh, the clippings and, uh, you know, putting them all together for our audiences who finally see. If we could have all the panelists together on the screen, it would be lovely. With this, we come to the end of our discussion. We've, uh, and thank you for sharing a whole spectrum of thoughts of what it means, um, you know, I would I would say feminine energy. I'll take up from uh, Kirtana rather than uh, addressing it to as uh, a woman. You know what are your experiences, thoughts, and how the life's journey has uh, affected your work or um, even the pandemic itself. So thank you for sharing that. But before we say goodbye, if uh, any one of you would like to share um, anything more, uh, it would be lovely. Or you have any question to ask each other. Ma yeah, okay, Maya wants to say, and even Neelamji wants to say something, yeah. And I think just keep everyone together on the screen team. Thank you. Uh, you muted, Maya. You know, the great opportunity in this, uh, having discovered Zoom and its various avatars, the, now these four women sitting here, could with a snap of a finger become 24, become uh, 704, and become 1,004. And I, I, mm, uh, I get goosebumps thinking uh, that um, 
this is in itself is such an opportunity. And I'd like mm -hmm. to say, and this is something that Kirtana and I were in a forum together, where mm -hmm. we haven't had this opportunity of mapping, mapping mm -hmm. women, women in India in theater, mm -hmm. you know, in, in different, so, whether it's in the rehearsal room, whether it is scripting together with someone else, whether it is devising something, all of this over a period of time to be able to put it together you know, maybe monthly, uh, something comes out that expresses um, what what is this? What are the women in theatre? Who are the women in theatre? What are they doing in in? Yeah. To, and to use this forum uh, to do it, which is so simply done. Maya, I'm so glad you pointed it out because I would like to share with you. Ketana is going to be a part of that uh, theater committee. So Women Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industry was created and Arts Leadership Council was created. And um, I, I was appointed the national vice president of the council. So we were just thinking of creating this theater committee of women with having you, Neelam Ji, and the seniors you know, as our advisory. And the first thing that we want to do is to map the journey of women theater directors uh, in India, but starting in a very linear format, which is Zoom and, you know, spanning it over hours according to the convenience of the artist. And then hopefully if the funds come in, we go uh, to their space and, you know, kind of document it. Further. Raman, so may I'm I just say, I'm sorry to keep butting in, but, but uh, you know, in, instead of these meetings where Neelam is the focus, Maya is the focus, we've, we've kind of done that for the last two years. Really There's cool. enough online. Now mm. what we need is to set up the kind of questions that you were you asked us, maybe mm. to re-twist them. And if mm. there's a whole bunch of women makers of different mm. kinds, there are actors, mm. there are performers, there are uh, technical, whatever, that mm. different groups of women are brought together in which they could be men as well. The lens is the, the, the feminine. Uh, and mm. then questions are being asked where we talk to each other. I think what makes right. women different is that we talk to each other. I don't want to be on another forum where I'm talking about my work. Yeah. Bilkul, bilkul. May I say something? Yeah. May I offer something? Bilkul. So the other day Go I was ahead, in a quite, I was in a, I was in a, can you hear me? Oh yeah. J just yeah. to tell you that I, the other day I was in a really amazing fishbowl process. I don't know if you've heard mm. of it, but it's a gestalt sort of, it's, it's where you have the, the personal is political so the, and mm. personal experience is unrefutable. Uh, so you have an inner circle of women who are, or men, it doesn't matter, and who are held by an outer circle and then it inverts, it kind of donuts out. Yes. So there's nobody talking, there's no leaders, there's no followers. But basically we accept that experience is inviolate mm -hmm. and we have a theme. So this particular theme was uh, experiencing the feminine in theater making. So this was the theme. Mm -hmm. It was absolutely amazing because nobody could say no you're wrong or no this is right or mm. none of that happened instead mm. each person's experience of how they experience the feminine for example somebody said um you know i just i i, I want to absent the feminine because the feminine has always denied me or, or for example for me i said i find the feminine is really vestigial and on the verge of extinction so different people experience mm. it differently mm. and it's all valid mm. but it was very mm. powerful because there was no debate and everybody was held and everybody's experience was just that it is their experience yeah true neelam ji wanted to say something uh, ma'am you muted am i okay now Hanj, yes uh, no um actually it was in response to what was being discussed earlier now it's gone into another direction yeah. but personally for me i'm as i've said it very often a technological refugee mm -hmm. i have no idea how to use technology i can press on a button and i can manage enough for making this new age communication possible for my life mm -hmm. i mean i'm uh, a couple of a month ago or two months ago, I attended somebody's birthday in London and there were people from all over the world. They went into rooms, they went on a picnic with them. You could almost smell and touch. I mean, so technology 
as Maya said, what we know is the tip of the iceberg. I don't even know the tip of the iceberg. I don't even know the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. um, I did this play, Black Box, which was actually done in my little rehearsal space. And because I have a filmmaker son, he filmed it. He filmed it frontal, he filmed it, filmed it by moving, and he filmed it by going inside the little space which we had created as the performance space. And because he's a child who has seen theater, he has the sense of becoming invisibilized and not disturbing uh, the actor's breath or what the actor is doing. And then he put it all together. And I thought it was quite interesting the way he put the film together, if uh, I can reminisce in it. Because it was a very, and she's seen the play as well. So mm -hmm. for me, it was a very interesting intersection between uh, theatre making and and that it's not just a document, documentation. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not with a single camera and you document for your record. But it becomes, it becomes actually something else. It it's like a film, you know. I don't know because I've seen lots of films which have been put up, put up by different, you know, whether it's the Royal Shakespeare Company or it's, you know, um, different companies put up their plays, and I find them plays which have been documented, and I don't, I don't connect with it. Yeah, I that would be just a recording of the play. Yeah, you know? yeah. That would. This was a theatre oh, film, you know, which kind yes. of it's own yeah, genre I'm, of. Yeah, I'm quite terrified of this new age uh, learning that I have to go through. You know, it's like I wouldn't know how to use it. It would like it's interesting, it's exciting, it's challenging, but it doesn't really interest me in, in the real sense. I like that whole physical space. I agree with the mm -hmm. that you know one is really bored with the proscenium, uh, the invisible fourth wall or whatever, and one is trying to explore other ways of making, of other ways of putting a performance in varied performance spaces mm -hmm. uh, to expand um, the way you see that you're not sitting on a seat, not acknowledging the person sitting next to you, but you can kind of move around and do other way, you know, look at it from varied perspectives. So I like that. I, I mean, that idea I respond to and I've done it in a lot of my work. Sure. The technology, I'm, you know, the people like me at my age, I fear technology. That's why hats off to Maya. She yeah. takes, she takes, it, takes, takes it all like a fish takes the water. But I don't have the ability. Yeah, it's these kind of different responses and how we respond yeah. to this technology or technological devices or mediums is what's going to create a very eclectic space for our audiences. And with that, we come to the end of uh, the sorry, discussion. Sorry, can I please ask how many how many people were in this in this forum today? Because this is not a Zoom platform so one doesn't know we are four panelists and there are few um, team members behind the screen at least five no, six no. of them and how many people have logged in to listen to this discussion? no so as i mentioned oh, in the no. beginning of the thing this is a recording uh -huh. which will be oh, screened on 18th and 19th december uh mm -hmm. and that's when people will be watching it Achha. okay so we will be putting in the trailer as part of the recording and with that, we come to the end of this uh, panel. I thank Jerangam for hosting this uh, extremely stimulating discussion that only leaves us with a desire that we need to continue discussing so many factors and processes and thoughts. Um, also, I request the audience, I'm coming to you, Keetna, to watch all the events and performances happening at Jerangam. 17th is offline and 18th and 19th is online. Over to you, Keetna. You want to say something? Oh my God, no, I just had an idea. Yes, Raman, I wanted to invite all of you to come and stay here at the farm with me. And why don't I've we do something do here, Raman? Why don't you, why, why don't you organize it? Because you're such a good organizer. So I'll be your host. <laughs> you know, I'm keep saying that. I think from an actor, I have to now just wear a hat of just the organizer. No, no I'm, I'm, I'm serious. serious. I all think these if you do a, But if you let's do, organize you it together, Deepana, you're much better yes, than I'm me. I'm feeling to it. Yeah, let's but invite let's all the women we know. Maya and everyone and what Maya was saying that everyone being together. Let's let's plan something out. I hope it works out. So let's thank you, Teacher Rangam, for... Please.
bringing us to this. We are, are already looking forward to a lot of things. Yes, ma'am, what were you saying? I said, I'm coming, Kirtana. Yes, it's I, beautiful. I, you know, you I have cannot tell you it. what so, joy that would give me. I cannot tell you. To have all you marvelous women together, imagine what we could conjure up. And, there's, and there are so many so more. <laughs> All right. Thank and you so, so many much. More. Exactly. Thank you, Dila, ma'am. Thank, Thank you, Maya. You. Thank you. Thank you. Looking Bye, forward. Thanks. Take okay. care. Thank you, Jerangam. Thank you.